Okay, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our third speaker, Dr. David Grabowski from Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, David and I were lucky enough to be colleagues together uh, several years ago uh, at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and had a good time uh, talking about a number of things. Uh, I learned about Dr. Grabowski that he is a big fan of Duke basketball. Um, and so, but, but that seems to be his one hobby, because if you look at his research record, he has devoted an, a, a tremendous amount of time to understanding the long-term care sector. So he is, he is published on, on every single portion of it, all the way from uh, nursing homes through home health care and to hospice care as well. He's extremely productive, highly knowledgeable in this area. And, and you kind of think it's, a, it's, you know, why is it, you know, he's so young and he's, he's, he, he's sort of doing work in this area. But I, I think he realized early on that there is, a, there is a real shortage of good, solid, economic, objective research in this area. And I, I think he's going to um, show, show a good deal of that to you today. And, I, and I'm looking forward to this talk. Great. Well, thanks, Vivian. I promise not to go on and on today about Duke basketball. I'll stick to uh, long-term long care. So my charge today, as, as I just said, is to talk about uh, long-term care under, under health reform. And when Vivian first invited me to speak today, it was about six months ago, uh, the CLASS Act was the sort of primary provision within the uh, health care reform bill dealing with long-term care. Uh, CLASS, as many of you probably know, is a voluntary long-term care insurance program. Or I guess I should say CLASS was a voluntary long-term care insurance program. Basically, from the time I was invited six months ago to today, the CLASS Act has basically been repealed. It's, on, it's currently on its deathbed. And uh, there, there's, you know, obviously that's going to change what, uh, the nature of what I was going to talk about. I'm not going to be able to give the presentation I thought I was going to give uh, six months ago. <laughs> the, the world changes. But what I would like to uh, do today is talk about where we go next here. It's obvious that uh, there, there's uh, a real need for reform in the long-term care area in our system. Class was a real opportunity. It was a missed opportunity. Um, but, we, but, th but there's still a problem there. And so how do we go about fixing this? So what I will do today is briefly introduce the long-term care problem, try to uh, suggest to you that this is really important and that we should be thinking about this in the area of health care reform. Then I'll turn and talk about the CLASS Act, what were the key elements here? What was the problem it was trying to address? Why did it fail? And where do we go next? And then I'll wrap up at the end with some concluding thoughts. So I'll start, and I apologize for those of you that work in the long-term care area, but I want to make certain we're all on, on common footing today. What is long-term care? Well, long-term care is really about functioning. It's services provided to individuals with limited cognitive and physical functioning. It's providing these individuals with assistance with activities of daily living, like bathing and dressing, and instrumental activities of daily living, like cooking and shopping. And basically, these are individuals that aren't able to provide these services for themselves, so long-term care uh, uh, provides them with assistance. One of the important aspects here is it's not uh, long-term care, uh, it's not acute care, it's not over a fixed period of time. It's, it's continually provided and hence continually expensive. So long-term care encompasses a broad range of uh, compensatory services. The personal care services I just described, social services like counseling. Uh, many individuals with long-term care needs uh, also require room and board. Transportation services like shopping, uh, taking individuals to medical appointments. And then it's awfully hard sometimes to determine where long-term care stops in medicine and rehabilitation starts. So imagine an individual has a stroke who has cancer, heart failure patients, diabetics. All of these individuals are going to need a mix of long-term care, but also uh, medical care, and in some cases, rehabilitative services, too. Where is long-term care delivered? Well, the majority of long-term care is actually delivered in the home. That's done informally, and what I mean by that, it's done by unpaid uh, family members and friends, then also formally by paid home care services. Individuals living in the home can also go out in the community and, and go to adult day settings. And then there are a range of residential settings like group homes, assisted living, and uh, nursing homes. So who needs long-term care? Well, basically 10 million individuals in the U.S. currently need long-term care. 
This slide, you know, each of the, the pie charts here addresses a different, I think, misperception about long-term care. On the left here, there's this perception out there that everyone that uses long-term care is an elderly individual. It is true that the majority of individuals using long-term care are older, about two-thirds, but just over a third of individuals are actually under the age of 65. This is an important point that I'm going to come back to. If we're designing some sort of insurance product for individuals who need long-term care, there's a real issue here. Are we designing a, a, a program for the non-elderly disabled who are currently disabled? It's very hard to kind of think about spreading risk when you have individuals who are currently disabled. Or are we thinking about individuals who will have long-term care needs as they get older? This tension is going to come back when I talk about the, uh, the CLASS Act, because it tried to do both, and that's really hard to do, to both provide coverage for individuals under 65 with disabilities and also be a, be a sort of a, a, an insurance product for individuals who are aging and will need services when they get older. The other misperception that I think is out there is that uh, everybody who needs long-term care lives in a nursing home. And you can see the, the population in a nursing home is large. About 17% of that 10 million are in a nursing home. But the majority of individuals are out there in the community. So less than one in five individuals receiving long-term care actually lives in a nursing home. This is also important in that the majority of individuals obviously want to want to live out in the community. They want to be in the least restrictive setting possible. Insurance products can help, obviously, in giving individuals control over where they receive long-term care services. So I, I next i am giving you sort of a quick overview of what, what is long-term care, who needs it, who provides it. I want to now take some time to tell you why I think uh, long-term care is so important why the CLASS Act was, such a, was trying to address such an, a fundamental problem in our health care system. So I'm going to go through four reasons why I think long-term care is an important public policy issue. It affects a large uh, portion of our population. It's largely an unprotected risk, I mean an uninsured risk. It's expensive and it's growing more so over time. And finally, it's supported by a badly frayed safety net. So let me start with this uh, idea that it affects a large portion of the population. So there's a lot going on in this, on, on this slide, but I, it's basically two histograms here, two charts here, and they're both showing us, uh, uh, making a similar point. So this is projected lifetime need, and on the left, that's just duration of need, and on the right, that's spending. For an individual who's age 65, this projects how much long-term care they're going to require and how much they're going to spend for the remainder of their life. So if you look at, at the left here, and, and this is you know, pretty simple, for an individual age 65, roughly 30% of those individuals going forward will need no long-term care. If you look over here on the right, however, those, those two uh, blue, that's Duke blue there on the right, um, you have individuals about, about 20%, that's Carolina blue, we don't like that so much, 20% um, <laughs> roughly will need between two and, and five years of long-term care. Here, in the darker blue, 20% of the population will require four or five or more years of long-term care. So 40% of the population is going to require at least two years of long-term care services. You can begin to see some of the risk-spreading possibilities. You have a big group who needs very little long-term care and a big group that needs quite a bit of long-term care services. And once again, these are individuals just turning uh, 65. If we, if we look at this similarly by, by expenditures, you have a big group, about 40% here, that aren't going to spend anything on, on long-term care. Then you have about 15% that will spend, in a present discounted value sense, about uh, between $25,000 and $100,000. And then a, another 15% that will spend over $100,000. So the point in both of these histograms is that there's real risk-spreading potential here. Lots of individuals who won't need any services, but lots of individuals who will need a lot of services. So next, I want, I want to show you uh, that, that long-term care is largely an unprotected risk um, in, in, in the U.S. The first, uh, another of the misperceptions is that, you know, many of you know this already, but we don't have universal coverage for long-term care. I often hear, wait, well, wait, doesn't Medicare cover long-term care? Medicare does not cover long-term care services. Medicare covers post-acute services in long-term care settings. So, for example, if I have a qualifying hospital stay of three days or more, I can go into a nursing home on a, a skilled nursing facility and stay, and I can be covered up to 100 days on the Medicare Part A benefit. 
that's not long-term care in the sense that I might need you know, months, years of long-term care services in a nursing home. Medicare is only going to pay for that part right after the hospital stay. Medicaid is the big government payer of long-term care services. Medicaid, however, as everyone knows here, is means tested. So it has an income and an asset threshold applied to it. I have to be below a monthly income level. My assets have to be below a level. Um, there's obviously the possibility of insuring against the risk here, because in order to qualify for Medicaid, I have to be uh, relatively poor. However, few people end up purchasing private long-term care insurance. There's actually been a big economics literature on why people don't purchase private long-term care insurance. There's sort of supply-side stories. There's demand-side stories. But suffice it to say that very few people, fewer than 10% of the population age 55 or older, end up purchasing private long-term care insurance. So the upshot of this is the fact that we don't have universal coverage on the public side and we have very little private insurance is that we end up burdening uh, three different uh, parts of uh, our system. One, we rely heavily on informal care from family members and friends. If you took all the hours of informal care that are provided each year and you assign a minimum wage to those, to those hours, the dollar value of that care would be as large, if not larger, than what we spend on formal long-term care services. So we, we invest a lot as families, and there are direct costs to that, you know, missing work, for example, to care for an elderly parent. There's also indirect costs. I might uh, uh, have health issues myself when I'm caring for an adult parent um, who is disabled. So we, we, we have a, a burden on family. There's also significant out-of-pocket payment in our, in our system. Um, we basically ask individuals to spend down their wealth until they qualify for Medicaid. Um, after uh, Part D was instituted, uh, prescription drugs is now basically covered. Uh, Long-term care is the largest source of catastrophic spending for elderly individuals in our health care system. This is where individuals uh, put their wealth uh, when, 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 when they're older, uh, if they have a, a health shock and need, and need long-term care. Finally, uh, we, we burden Medicaid. Uh, when individuals spend down their resources, uh, Medicaid is, is, is that safety net. So it's families, it's, it's people paying out of pocket, it's Medicaid. The combination of these suggests there's, there's catastrophic spending out there by certain individuals. There's real potential here for an insurance mechanism that would come in and protect us uh, against this, uh, this potential financial risk. So long-term care is costly, and it's getting more so over time. You can see that on this slide. I, I've um, tracked, and this is from the Congressional Budget Office, but basically starting in year 2000 here, projected out to 2040. The histogram here is spending here in billions, and you can see we're going from 2010, about 100, we spent about $150 billion on long-term care, and about half of that comes from the Medicaid program. So Medicaid's uh, uh, the big, big uh, dominant spender uh, in the long-term care area. That's projected largely by the growth in the population of elderly individuals to grow to be about $350 billion by 2040. So uh, a lot of growth here, and you can see what's, what's causing that growth is largely the growth in the elderly population. The red line is the age 65 plus population, which goes from 40 million people today to about 80 million people in the year 2040. You can see a similar growth in the age 85 plus population, which is the big long-term care uh, consumption population. So, you know, Amitabh sort of suggested to us earlier that everything's getting, you know, we're spending more on everything in health care. But this, this bullet at the top here, uh, long-term care is projected to double as a percentage of GDP. So, yes, it's, yes everything's getting more expensive. But, but due to the aging of the population, uh, long-term care is outpacing the growth in, in other areas. So finally, and the, the final reason we, we should be concerned about long-term care is it's currently supported by a badly frayed uh, safety net. So I, I'm just going to go through these relatively quickly in the interest of getting to the Class Act. But all these problems are, are really fundamental, and there's large kind of economics and health services literatures kind of addressing each one of these problems. But I talked about the heavy burden we place on families. Uh, families uh, there's a, the, you know, are really the backbone of our long-term care system. I think there, it's, it's safe to say that the direct and indirect costs we're placing on them have really uh, been, been a tremendous burden. 
States are really struggling with the cost of Medicaid. Uh, Long-term care is a big ticket item within, within Medicaid. And so uh, with state budget shortfalls, there's real interest in trying to get long-term care spending and hence Medicaid spending under control. Um, all too often, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we seek care in institutions where consumers would prefer that those services be pr provided in the community. All too often as well, in spite of all that we spend on long-term care, uh, quality of care has been found to be quite poor. And the final point is one I, I've spent a lot of my time over the last few years studying, is that long-term care is often uh, fragmented from other health care services. So you can think about hospitals, physicians, hospice, uh, home health agencies, all these other providers out there. Long-term care is paid differently, uh, organized differently, and so care is often really poorly coordinated across these different, different providers. So what's really encouraging about the Accountable Care Act and health care reform is it made an attempt to address all of these uh, different problems in, in, this, in this badly frayed safety net. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have an opportunity to talk about all these different elements uh, that were contained in the Accountable Care Act. However, I think the, the Q&A session might be a good, good opportunity to kind of talk a little bit. But we saw um, you know, real movement in terms of home and community-based services, real movement on the quality front, and then I think some really innovative demonstration programs to try to address the, uh, the lack of coordination I just described. I'm going to take my, you know, most of my time today to talk about the Class Act and kind of, once again, what it was, why it failed, and, and, and where we go next. So to, so to give you the full name of the Class Act, it's the Community Living Assistance Services and Support Act. And it was actually initially proposed by the late uh, Senator Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts. And with his passing, I, I think his colleagues and friends in the Senate felt a real push to go ahead and pass this uh, legislation in his honor. And so that was a really important point that shouldn't be overlooked about why uh, I think there was so much enthusiasm for the Class Act in the Congress. What's sort of ironic is with his passing, um, obviously Scott Brown was elected in, in Massachusetts, and that led to a very different process of adoption of the health care reform legislation. We didn't go through the usual process of working across the, the House and the Senate. We had to go through the reconciliation process. I won't bore you with details of how that process works. But suffice it to say, we had to uh, work from the flawed Senate version of the bill. And what was flawed about it in, in terms of class is that it had all these provisions that led to, a, uh, led to an act that wasn't very uh, financially viable over time. And I'll talk more about that in just a few moments. But uh, a lot of the problems here were when Senator Brown was elected, we had to go with this you know, limited version of the bill. And that limited version um, really became untenable over time financially. So what's the, uh, the basic idea of CLASS? Well, it's a voluntary cash-based disability insurance program that's designed to be targeted towards working age adults. And I've, I've italicized the word working here um, largely because um, as you'll see in a few moments, this is one of those loopholes that was created in the legislation. This was intended to be largely a program, uh, an insurance program for working age individuals who are relatively healthy, uh, who would then over time, some of them would need long-term care, some wouldn't, and we could have this kind of risk spreading uh, properties that, that, that we often uh, think about when we think about an insurance uh, program. You know, We have a group of people who are insured, some get sick over time, some don't. Um, unfortunately, um, the definition of working here was, was so um, minimal that we actually uh, would have ultimately attracted a very different risk pool into the, into the program. So let me just give you some of the basics on, on, on class so that you understand this, and then I'll, then I'll talk about the economics of it. But the first point is who can enroll in class? And the basic answer there is anyone. Um, it, it's a voluntary program, once again, for working age adults. That's not a misprint. There's no underwriting with class. And what I mean by that is there's no pre-existing conditions, no, no, no effort to exclude anyone based on their, 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 you know, their prior health or anything about them, their prior behaviors or smoking history, anything. Everybody was welcome, no underwriting, and no real effort to price the risk. So the only um, uh, way that premiums were adjusted here is by age. So all 40-year-old individuals who enroll in the program whether they're, they have diabetes, whether they're healthy, whether they're a lifelong smoker, whether they uh, have a lifelong disability, they're all um, charged the same premium. 
that, that may present some problems. From, obviously, from a social justice perspective, that, that's, that's maybe nice. From, a, from an economic or, or, or efficiency perspective, maybe not so nice. So who is, who is eligible for the benefits? Uh, the benefits are, 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 will be triggered based on an activities of daily living uh, limitation. So do you need help with bathing, uh, dressing, walking, these kinds of limitations, and then cognitive performance. Individuals will have to pay into the program for five years. And the only requirement is that they work during three of those five years and earn in each of those years $1,200. That's incredibly low, right? And what was happening, I had a colleague that was actually at HHS helping in terms of the implementation here. He said there were groups coming in from subsidized housing development saying, gosh, if, if we can get our um, uh, you know, population here in our, in our subsidized housing unit, if we can get everybody um, working and you know, somehow figure out a way to make each, you know, for them to make $1,200, we can trigger all these benefits for these individuals. We're basically going to buy this for everybody in our complex. And we saw this, and they began to see this over and over again. Economists have a term for this. It's called gaming, and it's not a, not not gaming in, on, on your uh, on your on, on your handheld or something like that. This is there's not a positive connotation to this. Um, you know, consumers are behaving strategically um, in, in order uh, to sort of respond to the incentives here, and this is a very loose in, incentive. Um, next, what what are the benefits? Well, it's a cash benefit, and obviously consumers really like. Cash, you know, it, it, relative. It's not a service benefit. It's not so many days of assisted living care, so many days of nursing home care, so many days of um, home health care. It, it, it's a it's a cash benefit. So it's fifty dollars a day. The individual could spend it any way they want. They could pay a family member. They could pay to have a ramp put in in, in front of their house. Um, they, they could do whatever they want. And this comes out to be just over eighteen thousand dollars per year. So. What's interesting about the program is it wasn't set up to be an entitlement. It was supposed to be based on premiums, and the Congressional Budget Office suggested that uh, premiums would have to be about $125 a month. A lot of the private actuaries that actually analyzed this had that number much, much higher. I think they were suggesting a very different risk selection than the Congressional Budget Office was thinking about. But the basic idea is that individuals, um, you'd get a, you know, a balanced selection of risk and you could charge individuals $125 per month and on average, and obviously would be adjusted by age. Older individuals would pay more, younger individuals would pay less. And it would take five years to vest and then you would be in the program. Um, and and they, there would be some subsidies for, for lower income individuals. For example, one number that was put out there was $5 per month for individuals below the federal poverty level. So in theory, this is supposed to be uh, a self-sustaining program that takes in premiums and then pays out benefits. Um, it's not designed to be an entitlement, but as you'll see in a moment, as I sort of talk about the economics of this, when you combine sort of voluntary enrollment with not, no underwriting, you're really asking for a really unfavorable selection of risks to come into the program. And that was really the, the, the problem here. And finally, how does this program work vis-a-vis -vis Medicaid? Class was designed to be the first payer. So those $18,000, for example, if you're in a nursing home and Medicaid eligible and you had a class policy, class would be the first, policy, first payer of that $18,000. Medicaid would pay on the back end. And so presumably the class program could save Medicaid uh, some expenditures by you know, uh, that offset there. Whether that actually would have occurred is, is an empirical question, but there is the potential here to save Medicaid some dollars by putting individuals uh, in, in the class program. So this is a slide. I've actually cut this out of a presentation that somebody did at HHS, Health and Human Services. You can still see the insignia there if you look really hard from HHS. And I want to show this because this is really gets at the economics of this program. So there was a series of, almost think about this like as a decision tree. And there were a series of, of points on this tree where the, you know, the, the administration had, a, had an option. And they could sort of take uh, an option that was more or less stringent, maybe from a, from a cost control, from a financial solvency perspective. At every point, the administration, the designers of this policy, and once again, a lot of this relates to Scott Brown's election and being stunk, stuck with this <laughs> uh, flawed uh, uh, Senate bill. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, uh, but you can see that at each of these points, um, w w w there's, there's a sort of a more lenient option that was chosen. So first, we wanted long-term care insurance. We could, we could have a mandatory program or a voluntary one. 
uh, mandatory solves everything, right? If we get everybody in there, we don't have to worry about risk selection. We don't have to, you know, all, all these other problems kind of work themselves out. A lot of European countries have mandatory long-term care programs. That wasn't, uh, the Obama administration wanted this to be voluntary. And so assuming it's voluntary then, do we underwrite? Do we try to try to price risk? Do we try to exclude certain individuals with pre-existing conditions? Do we do we try to kind of uh, limit uh, you know uh, enrollment among? Uh, and, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't design programs for individuals um, with pre-existing conditions. I'm saying that if you want to design an insurance product, it's really hard to do both. It's really hard to design both um, a program that fits kind of risk-spreading properties for, for healthy individuals and also brings in individuals who already have uh, long-term care needs. So next, we, they, 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 they opted not to do the underwriting under the, the Senate version of the bill. So then there's this option, do we do a service benefit? Do we give you so many days of nursing home care, so many days of home health care, and so forth? Or do we make it a cash benefit? Everybody loves cash, right? You'd rather have it in cash, and you get to decide what you do with your, your money, not, uh, not being forced to, to you know, consume different services. We went with the cash benefit. And then finally, if you're going to do cash, there's a lot of evidence suggesting you want to marry that cash to, to counseling. Rather than doing active counseling, the, 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 the bill ended up with, with optional counseling. So in every point here, we get a more lenient um, bill that, that's going to be potentially less financially solvent. Uh, this is sort of the problem, um, and, and it, it's a hard one to get around when you have this kind of package of properties. Um, I've, I've said this before, but from an economic perspective, this is out of the sort of adverse selection hall of fame. There's real moral hazard problems out of the moral hazard hall of fame. From the gaming perspective, it's out of the gaming hall of fame. Like, there's just real problems here. So you're beginning to see why, why this, why this uh, policy never saw the light of day. So I, I've been pretty critical, but I do want to be fair, or at least try to be fair, and talk about what are some of the possible strengths of the, of the Class Act. Obviously, from a social justice perspective, once again, it gives everyone access to this benefit, and, there's, and, and that, that, that's, that's potentially a, a, a real positive. This lack of underwriting may be bad from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, but from an equity standpoint, it's quite, uh, quite nice. It potentially, and I'll, I'll stress that, creates a broad risk pool for ensuring long-term care, Cash, once again, is very popular with individuals. It gives them maximum flexibility. And once again, it's supported by premiums. It's not designed to be an entitlement. What are some of the criticisms? First, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively modest benefit. $18,000 is only going to cover a fraction of an individual's nursing home costs. It costs about $70,000 to be in a nursing home for a year. It's really unclear whether people are going to actually participate in this. Take-up rates uh, uh, were expected to be quite low. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that about 2% of the, of the population would use this policy. Some thought that was an overestimate. <laughs> There's obviously, as I've already described, you know, and, and this is what economists, as, as you're probably gathering, love to do, is we love to find sort of problems with policies and point towards them. And, and as I said earlier, there's, there's real possibilities here for gaming, the work requirement, real possibilities for moral hazard. What I mean by that is a propensity of individuals to, to consume more services in the presence of the benefit. So in, with a cash benefit, this, this effect is obviously going to be magnified. And then finally, this combination of voluntary opt-out with adverse, um, with, with the lack of underwriting really creates an adverse selection problem. And I've included a, a quote here by, by Charles Krotheimer. It's, it's probably a little bit of her hyperbole. Actually, who are we kidding? It's a lot of hyperbole here, but it, it, it's a good quote. Um, it says that the Class Act promises uh, to be the biggest budget buster in the history of the welfare state. So I, you know, I don't think that's probably true, but, it, but it, really what, what Krauthammer was getting at was this combination of, of voluntary enrollment with no, no underwriting. So, so why did we, we get such a flawed bill? And, and I want to give you one final reason here before thinking about where we go next. So I've already told you about you know, Senator Kennedy and wanting to honor his memory. And I've already told you, um, you know, ab about Scott Brown and sort of his, his election. There's actually a third reason here. Remember, when, when the Obama administration uh, promised us health care reform, they didn't just tell us it was going to be budget neutral. They told us it was going to save money. And it was going to save money over a 10-year window. And, and, and this is um, really important, that 10-year window, when you think about policies such as class. Um, remember, class has a five-year vesting period. So you're paying in money for five years and then taking out uh, benefits further downstream. 
So with that kind of um, uh, uh, revenue stream and those kind of costs, class is actually a real, I'll put this in quotes, a real saver in the short term. And so I, I've termed this like financial hydraulics here, and that the, the finance here really lifted up the Obama uh, health care reform package. You can see, and these are cumulative savings in billions. So you can see uh, up front the, the revenue starts coming in from the projected revenue from, from premiums quickly gets up there. Out to 2020, it's up to $87.6 billion. We're taking in lots of money here. In terms of costs, it's just really advertising in those first years, right? Trying to get people enrolled in the program, maybe some administration. It's not until about year five that this begins to kick up, right, as people begin to uh, need services. And so at the end of this, they estimated the Congressional Budget Office that the Class Act would save, and once again, you've got to be very careful, save $72.5 billion in the first decade. Clearly, you know, this is obviously opposed to what Krauthammer was just saying, that you know, this is going to be the biggest budget buster. Well, the problem is that you know, if we track this out to 2030, 2040, and beyond, probably by 2030, I don't think these lines have crossed. By 2040, 2050, they've crossed. And now, all of a sudden, we have much higher costs than revenue. And that's really the problem here. And this actually accounted for about half the savings, I think, of, of, of the Obama uh, health care legislation was here. And so in the short run, um, this, this was an unfortunate way that class was kind of used in the, in the legislation. Because once again, it's, it's actually addressing a really important problem, but it's really being misused here as a potential saver, given the, the, the limited way that the legislation was adopted. So as I noted at the outset, class is, is basically on its deathbed. There's been an effort in the, in the Senate to try, to try to repeal it since earlier this year. Um, the writing was really on the wall in September uh, when the Wall Street Journal learned that the uh, class actuaries had been reassigned. Um, the program last month was shut down. Um, uh, the, the Department of Health and Human Services released a letter suggesting that, the, that they not move forward with the program. And although it hasn't been officially repealed, I think it's basically uh, done. So, you know, that that you know, it's it's sort of a, a sad story. Maybe I think it's a, it's a positive outcome because of the limited nature of the legislation. But it didn't. You know, we're still left with this problem. You know, we have all this unprotected risk in our system. You know, how do we go about fixing that? And that's where I, I'd sort of like to go next with with the rest of my time, it's thinking about what what are the next set of reforms here, and how do how do we go about addressing uh, all this kind of catastrophic spending that's going out there, going on out there, in the long term care area. So I first want to kind of rule out a very extreme solution. I don't think anyone's going to do away with Medicaid in the near future. I also don't think we're going to come up with some brand new mandatory long-term care entitlement program. I don't think we're going to get universal coverage in the next few years, especially with all the, uh, the budget shortfalls and the economy right now. So let's think about at the margin what kind of changes we might see that actually may begin to address uh, the issues I've been talking about today. The first program, and I'm, I'm not advocating they call it Class 2.0. I think you want to actually <laughs> distance yourself as much as possible from class. But there is some uh, model out there, and I think you could actually build it on, on the sort of skeleton of class and actually come up with a much more financially viable program. In fact, when the actuaries went out and began to sort of cost out class with some of the some of the corrections I put up on the slide, the numbers look much better. It's not the biggest b budget buster in history anymore. It actually looks quite quite viable. But basically what, what, what I would advocate doing is build on the strengths, have a premium-based system. Once again, it's going to be risk spreading. It's going to be based on a cash benefit. But introduce some, some checks here that will actually correct some of those weaknesses uh, that we've been talking about. Um, fix that employment standard. That's just that's way too low. You can put it up to $12,000, for example, from from 1,200. Introduce uh, minimum underwriting. I don't want to leave anybody out here, but I think you can't do everything in one piece of legislation. Have have programs targeted for those with pre-existing conditions. Get uh, maybe a, a healthier group here at baseline uh, in, in terms of your pool. And obviously, you can mandate counseling. Don't make it optional. Make certain if people are going to spend their own money, you're advising them on, on, on how to spend that money in, in a productive way. So I, I really like that idea, but that's not the only idea. We could also think about um, trying to grow the private long-term care insurance market. This has been a goal for decades, and it really hasn't, hasn't gotten very far. But one thing that a lot of states have tried is offering tax incentives for people to purchase private long-term care insurance. 
The problem, the good news is that people have actually purchased private long-term care insurance in the context of these, uh, these, these uh, tax credits. The not so good news, it actually, we end up spending more uh, from a government perspective on these tax credits than we get back in savings in Medicaid and Medicare. And so they're financially a loser, uh, but uh, you know, they, they do get people on the private long-term care insurance. Another potential option is to reform Medicaid. One of the, I told you earlier, there's a big economic literature about why people don't purchase private long-term care insurance. Part of that literature addresses Medicaid crowd out. Why go purchase private long-term care insurance when there's a possibility of just spending down and being on Medicaid? And some of the work that, that's, that's looked at that issue has simulated what if we moved from, you know, every state has their own asset requirements. What if everybody moved to the most stringent requirements in the country? What would that do in terms of private long-term care insurance and purchase? Once again, it would go up, but only marginally. It would only have a percentage point or two effect on overall long-term care insurance rates. It's not clear that tweaking Medicaid, making it a little bit more stringent, is really going to kind of dramatically change the world here. One area that I find very promising is uh, maybe altering the way Medicaid treats home equity. Currently, when you qualify for Medicaid in long-term care, you have an income threshold, as I said, an asset threshold. But in, in considering that asset threshold, your home equity is exempt. And so um, you could have up to a half million or 750K, depending on the state. You could have a $400,000 home, but still be on Medicaid. Somehow we need to tap into that home equity. Maybe it's a reverse mortgage. Uh, maybe there's ways of kind of uh, putting that, that home equity into play. And I also think there's probably some lessons we could learn from other countries. And I, I want to show you these data. We always hear about how the U.S. is an outlier. We spend so much more than everybody else in health care. I just want to show you a, a quick comparison here of the U.S. versus some other OECD countries. And the good news is we're not the, the country here on the right that looks really you know, much, much higher than everyone else. Surprisingly, it's Sweden. So this is what, what percent combined public and, and private, public's in blue here, private's in green, combined, what, what percentage do we spend in terms of our, our GDP on long-term care? You can see the U.S. is right here in the middle. We're with a group, the Netherlands, Canada, Germany, and the UK. We all spend more than, than Ireland. Sweden's kind of an outlier on this side. We don't look so bad here, actually. And there, I, I think there's a lot we could actually learn from other countries. One point to note, however, is if you look at the green share relative to the blue, so how much is private versus how much is public, you know, with the exception of the UK, we look very different than these other countries. Most of them are public, and so there's this real effort in this country to relieve the burden on Medicaid, get more on the private side. We're not doing so bad on, on, on that margin relative to these other countries. Most of these countries have mandatory systems, uh, and so they're very different than the U.S. Uh, I, I think this is one area where we, you know, in, in healthcare, it's, it's hard sometimes to learn from other countries. In long-term care, I think there's a lot of potential here. So I, I put a strike through here on, on the Class Act. I think, I think we can take that off the table. But once again, I think we, we saw a lot of uh, gains uh, in, in the long-term care area in, the, in, these, in these other areas with each home and community-based services, quality, and coordination. And I, I think that there, there, there were real positive developments. And uh, using Vivian's kind of framework of the good, the bad, and the ugly here, I'm a, I'm a big Clint Eastwood fan, so that, that was exciting to, to, to see that reference. And, um, but, but I also thought it fit really well here, because there's some good, um, lots of positive developments I had on the, on the previous slide there on the bottom here. I, I think we're, we will make some headway on some important problems. Some bad, and that I think we're, we're still a ways to go in terms of figuring out how we protect against all this uninsured risk that's out there in the long-term care area. And then I think we had the ugly here, and that was the failure of the class act and kind of just the, the debacle that it became. So let me take this as my, my final slide in an effort to sum up, and then we can do uh, questions. But I, I, I think all of us have had some experience with long-term care with a family member, and I, I think it's safe to say that it will affect all of us going forward. Long-term care wasn't the centerpiece in health care reform, uh, but there, there were some important changes However, uh, there, there still much work still remains to be done, and I think the, the repeal of the Class Act is one area where I think we want to look uh, closely moving forward. And finally, and I, I think this is a really important point, if we're going to try to get individuals um, into the system prior to their long-term care years, the time to act is now. 
um, if, if we wait 20 years to reform the system, the baby boom is going to be uh, already in their retirement years. And I think, I think this challenge only gets greater. So I'll, I'll stop on that point and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Jane Bevan. I've spent my career in Houston on home and community-based long-term care, so I actually appreciate the attention to the issue because it's huge. Um, and I think no matter what happens, the bottom line is families are going to carry this burden and they're going to provide the care, and we owe it to them to support them in their effort. And I really believe um, there's opportunity for businesses and corporations to contribute to addressing this problem by how they support families who are trying to work and, and um, carry this load. So I'm interested in your thoughts about whether or not you, what kind of opportunity or obligation or role you might see for the corporate sector in addressing long-term. Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, we have all these different benefits, maternity benefits and different ones. I, I'm not aware of a lot of corporations that have tried to incorporate kind of long-term care benefits into their package, but more and more, you know, you have individuals, you know, the sandwich generations worrying about their parents and worrying about uh, their kids. That would be a really innovative model uh, out there. Yeah, that, that's the corporation side. Some, some state governments and, and the federal government has also thought about, are, are there models out there where we can pay care caregivers or give them tax credits or, or other sort of mechanisms? The hard part with that, you know, from an economic, from, from a, I think, a, a social value perspective, I think that people like those programs. I think they're, they're very popular, and I think they, they do add value. The problem is they cost a lot. And, and there's, there's a lot of what we call crowd out, you know, of individuals who were providing these services anyway and now are getting paid to do it. That, that's a good thing on the one hand in that I'm being compensated for the care I'm providing for my, my, my parents. Not so good in the sense of um, we're not incentivizing new, new behaviors here. Uh, we're not sort of bringing more people into the fold. So uh, r real cost implications when you begin to, to do that. And I, I imagine companies are sort of faced with those, those same sorts of questions. But I, I, I think it's a really excellent so suggestion. I, I've not heard of any companies kind of going down that route. But it... <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Aldo. I'm a physician at Texas Children's. I have a question um, about the long-term care. What, what makes up the most expensive parts of, of long-term care? Because it, it seems that we're kind of assuming that it's a very efficient, quality-based uh, kind of system, when in fact it's probably not. So we're kind of uh, wanting to get more people in, uh, enrolled and, and throw money into it when it might be not a, not a great. So, so the, the big ticket item in terms so, so Go back to the previous question. The big providers, really the backbone of the system, are unpaid caregivers. But in terms of where the dollars are, the dollars are still in nursing homes. I mean, that's still where the, where the dollars uh, lie here. Um, in terms of efficiency, no, I, I agree. It, it's, it's not the most uh, efficient part of our system. It's not efficient within long-term care. I think there, there's, in the, there's a possibility of providing services in less restrictive settings. I also don't think it's, it's uh, efficient vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the economy, the health economy. So I, I think there's a lot of cost shifting that goes on between long-term care settings covered by Medicaid and hospitals covered by Medicare, physicians, uh, skilled nursing facilities that are covered by Medicare. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of problems there uh, and, and a lot of opportunity for coordinating care and that's uh, you know part of what the the Accountable Care Act tried to do uh, with the demonstration programs I mentioned in coordination of care is try to bring long-term care into the system and so long-term care providers wouldn't be paid separately for caring for a duly eligible individual but rather um, would receive some sort of capitated rate would have incentives to think about, is this nursing home care appropriate? Is this hospital care appropriate? Could these services be provided in a lower cost setting? I, I think that's where a lot of the efficiencies lie. You know, to, to push on this a little bit further, if you think about, um, you know, a nursing home, the, the question always comes up, so why don't states, why doesn't Texas uh, do away with their nursing homes, or largely for all but a few individuals, and just make, you know, lots of uh, home and community-based programs out there? And I think the cost problem has really been, been the issue here. When, when, when you open up those programs, you do get some desired substitution away from nursing homes, but you get lots of individuals who are currently in the community receiving care from family members and friends who are going to enter these programs. Um, they're, they're popular programs. They're, the pe people like them. And, and it's not like entering a nursing home where 
um, it's only those individuals who, who truly need services or who um, don't have any other options. Home and community-based services uh, are, are quite popular. And so from a financing perspective, you might have some desired substitution out of nursing homes, but this undesired substitution, once again, from a financing perspective of individuals who are receiving informal care from family and friends, are now entering the program. And so I, I think there is some inefficiency in overly high nursing home usage, but some of it's just an economic story, that it's very hard uh, to design home and, you know, home and community-based services because of their, their, their popularity. And I know that, that sounds sort of backwards, that, wait a second, people like this so much, why, why shouldn't we have more of it? Well, the problem is it's been very hard to gear services to individuals who otherwise would have entered a nursing home. I don't think we've been able to really target very well, because there's, it's not just health that predicts that, that nursing home entry. It's family dynamics, it's wealth, it's all these other factors. Mm -hmm. In a place like Houston, just getting from point A to point B, especially at rush hour, is so terribly <laughs> time-consuming. I mean, you know, there are stats for that, too, and it's just something you'd have to factor in if you're planning on leaning on the families more. Yeah. We, we have that problem in Boston, too, <laughs> unfortunately. So, David, in the legislation, I'm not sure I saw anything having to do with uh, monitoring or improving the quality of long-term care in nursing homes, but that's what you seem to hear about. It, you know, it appears in the popular press all the time. And do, do you think that's because what CMS was already doing was sufficient, or do you think there should be some change in that area? There, there was... There was a couple of changes here, but they, they, I, I think these were some of the more marginal changes that occurred under the legislation. So here, there, there was, there's been a lot of concern, for example, about private equity investment in the nursing home sector. And Texas is actually one of the states where this has occurred, where these big private equity companies have come in and, and bought uh, nursing home chains from publicly traded companies. And there's real concern about who really owns the nursing home, who owns the, the capital, who, who, who's operating the facility. And so there's been a big push towards greater transparency of ownership. And actually, there's a movement now to actually publish the true ownership structure on the Internet, on, on, on the government report card website. And so that's one movement. I don't know how meaningful that's actually going to be as a development. Uh, I'd be much more concerned about other indicators of quality. And I'm not, as, as a researcher, when I see these Byzantine kind of ownership structures, I, I can't make a lot of sense out of them. I wonder if your typical nursing home consumer is actually going to be able to say, you know, uh, you know, oh, there is a private equity group three three levels up in the ownership structure. You know, so I, I don't think that's an actually a, a, all, all that you know positive of a of, of a development. There's also, you know, criminal background checks, elder abuse prevention. I, I think these are relatively marginal developments in terms of a, a, a big policy issue. So I, I think as we're, we're looking forward, it's not just a, a new class type act, but also I think further, further restrictions here. Although I, sh I should note in, in response to Vivian's question that the nursing home sector is heavily regulated in its current form. And so, to, you know, we, we are sort of adding kind of regulation on a heavily regulated sector already. And so, you know, I, I think there's ways in which we can probably improve care. And in fact, we've kind of been moving away from regulation with, with more market-based interventions, report cards, pay for performance, you know, these kinds of measures. But I, I think there's probably more we, we could do there in this area. Yeah, Kosley. I have a question related to the, the coordination aspects you're mentioning on this slide, because if we think of where where the healthcare dollars are are the greatest? It's probably in the population that's receiving services from these multiple multiple dimensions. How do you think there's more that 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 could be done in in terms of both hospice as well as thinking about entry and exit from hospitals to nursing homes? That somehow because the systems are are, are, are separate there. Oh, a absolutely. Yeah. Now we've done uh, the rate of readmission, which Coastley is describing here. The rate of readmission among the Medicare population has been shown to be quite high. We've done a series of studies where we've isolated this readmission among people that are discharged to a nursing home. The bounce backs rate there is, is is incredibly high as well. And so there's a real churning individuals leaving the hospital 
10, 20, 30 days later coming right uh, via the nursing home, coming right back to the hospital. And so I think there's a lot of potential savings here. And I, we, we've thought a lot about what are, the, what are the financial incentives? How do we begin to think about um, changing those incentives such that hospitals have a, a stronger incentive to discharge residents to nursing homes in a healthier state? How do nursing homes have a, have a stronger incentive to try to care for them on site and not readmit them to the hospital? I think there's a lot of potential savings there. I think hospice um, in long-term care is, is a huge area uh, of, of potential savings. I think the, the hospice benefit is often misused in long-term care. I think it's actually been a cash cow for a lot of nursing homes in terms of how they've used it. I, I don't mean to say that hospice isn't isn't a good program. I think in long-term care, however, it's been somewhat mixed about, you know, a lot of nursing homes have this strong incentive to bring hospice in because they still get their daily rate, and then the hospice is paid separately. And so uh, there's real financial incentives at play here. Uh, and and I, I think moving forward, that's, that's one area where we really want to think about reform, is I think there's a lot of dollars in hospice, a lot of dollars in uh, readmissions. There was, a, there was another question. Sorry. Uh, that actually leads right into my question, which has to do with hospice. Um, is Medicare still considering a demonstration project to look at the opportunity for concurrent care to allow patients to receive their acute benefit while tapping into the hospice benefit, which, again, those of us in the hospice industry feel will ultimately reduce the cost of care for the patient significantly? Yeah, I, I haven't actually, I don't know if other, other people on the panel have been following that. I, I haven't... Uh... I actually haven't been, been following that, but it's, it's a good idea, and I, I think there's a lot of possibilities for that kind of intervention in, in long-term care, which I, I, I have been following closely, as I was just talking about. I, I, it, it's, it's really unclear to me where kind of hospice starts and, and, and nursing home care starts, for example, and whether there aren't some economies there that we couldn't leverage, and right now I think we're, we're almost paying twice, and I think we could do a better job of this, and I, I, I think a lot of big nursing home chains have recognized this and started their own own hospice companies. And so I, I think there's real uh, potential here uh, for, for some economies and for some savings. Is there another? Oh, in the middle there. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Don, Don Levitt. And uh, I think the long-term care problem really portrays our medical uh, expense problem in a very dramatic way. It's my understanding that people 65 or over have about 175,000 median income, something like that. Uh, but those 65 or over are also estimated to spend about 250,000 on health care expenses. So if, if a person buys long-term care, what he's really doing is he's, he's, he's doing it for the government. You know, he's not really doing it for himself because he's not really protecting any assets. Also, uh, the person worries about paying all this money into the insurance company, uh, never getting anything back unless he has a claim, and wondering if his premiums are going to go up, which they have dramatically over the years. I'm wondering uh, how you feel about these annuities slash long-term care combination plans where um, for a fairly small fee, the annuity turns into the cash value, uh, say, triples, uh, for long-term care benefits. Yeah, so I, I, I think you, you've described some of the reasons that the private long-term care insurance market hasn't taken off, and that, uh, you know, economists and other researchers have spent a lot of time sort of analyzing this this marketplace. And you know, uh, some people have called it asset protection. You know, there's, there's a lot of reasons for why you might not want to uh, purchase one of these these, these policies. I, I think that actually explains part of the reason why the Class Act was was actually put into put into place. It was a potential to get government backing. There's confidence that the government's still going to be there in 20 or 30 years. Don't anyone laugh? Um, you know, it, it, I, I think we will. Um, with these private companies, there's a lot of risk there about whether whether they're actually um, going to be around. And so I think there were there were there were some real nice aspects to having the government um, actually enter this marketplace. Unfortunately, it was a flawed plan, as we talked about. But I think your question points out several of the the reasons why I think the government got involved in this to begin with. 
you asked specifically about these these products. I actually find those very innovative, much like I described the kind of trying to uh, use a reverse mortgage. I, I think we need to think outside the box here. I, I, I've read some about these combination life insurance, long-term care insurance products. I, I think we need to get more creative around around a lot of these these products in the marketplace. I, I wouldn't want to be selling a standard private long-term care insurance product for some of the reasons you've talked about. I, I think it's been a really tough marketplace, and I, I think it's in need of some innovation. And I, I, I like a lot of these new products, like reverse mortgages, like the annuities, like com combining with life insurance. What about selling to couples? It's, it's clear one of us might you know, get our long-term care from, from the other. Maybe the, the remaining uh, uh, member of the couple then could get it, um, use the insurance policy and purchase it in the marketplace. There, there's lots of these kinds of ideas. Unfortunately, we haven't we haven't seen a lot of, uh, of them um, put into play and you know, used in a, in, in a major way. Oh, there's I'm back. I think uh, something that's going to really exacerbate the problem is in 2014 when hospitals can't readmit someone within 30 days because right now you could go from the hospital to the nursing home and Medicare will pay for like 90 days depending on the cost of the nursing home. And often those people go right back into the hospital close to the end of that 90 days and do this. And so I'm thinking in 2014 we're going to see a, a huge problem arise that I haven't heard a lot of discussion about. Yeah, and, and actually in this fiscal year, starting uh, last month, there's a hospital readmission penalty for uh, heart failure, heart attack, and pneumonia. And basically, uh, th those hospitals with high rates in those areas are going to receive lower payments across all their Medicare discharges. And so I think that's going to have a dramatic effect. The CBO has estimated really big savings from it. I think that's kind of the good news. The less good news, potentially, is big policies like that have unintended consequences. And I think you want to be really, really careful. You know, uh, you think about a hospital system, and are they telling their ER then to readmit people, or what are they telling them to do? How are they coding individuals as they're coming back into the door? These are the kind of things economists worry about. I, I'm concerned with these big kind of payment changes up top, but I agree with you. Uh, providers are going to respond to them. There's, there's no doubt about that. There, there's going to be a big sea change. And hospitals are, are really concerned. I, I met with a big nursing home chain recently. They, they want to show value to this to this hospital chain so they can get their discharges. We want to have low rates of readmission. On the one hand, that, that, that's a nice story, right? You know, different provider groups working together. There's efficiencies there. Um, I, I just I, I worry about the unintended consequences that accompany those sort of good behaviors. But I, I think you're right. I, I think there are some big changes afoot. Great. Oh. Sure. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, could you go back to that slide where you had the ages, the age 65, uh, you know, the percentage of 65, and then those were 35, yeah. And 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 I guess uh, yeah, that's yeah. it, that's it. I guess my question is, you since you're in Houston, Texas, we had an article that was in the paper. A uh, couple of weeks ago about the disparity of assisted living facilities and how these home assisted facilities have become a business. We have, I think, that the fees that paid here are higher than New York, Boston combined. Uh, same thing with the ambulance. But there's a big gap there. And so I think that's one of the problems that conservatives are having a problem with because, as the first speaker said, there's no check and balance on some of this. And I think they've been quite well. They, meaning corporate raiders, have been quite well in taking care of that to make sure. But you, you, you've you, uh, got a figure up there I think you need to clarify for me because assisted living facilities are long-term care. And so I, I, I was somewhat... Um crude here, and I, I put assisted living in the community, although you're right. I, I, another way to break this out would have been residential, non-residential. I said nursing home community. Assisted living is, is residential, so um, it, it's, a, it's a good point of clarification. Um, that would increase the number in residential uh, facilities. 
Uh, and obviously, assisted living has been been a, a big uh, growth area in recent years. And so um, that, that would, great, yeah, I, it is in the sense that it's not paid for by Medicare or Medicaid, and so it's paid privately. And it's sort of been off the radar in terms of research. We don't we don't have data on on individuals other than their Medicare claims that are in those facilities. So it, I think it's an, it's a real growth area for researchers. The hard part is sort of getting data that we can we can look at there. The only reason I'm saying because we have a higher increase of people who have mental and emotional problems, yeah. which are most likely to be impacted and then have funds or whatever systems are going to take care of them, mm-hmm. obviously in some cases are misusing that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I'm not quite sure who is going to have to address that, but that's going to have to be a part of that discussion as well in terms I, of this long term. I think people getting a little confused. When you get old and you broke down, you just die mm-hmm. like my mother and father. <laughs> but those of us who might be a little bit under 65, right and affected mentally or emotionally. I'm a veteran myself, so I'm going to go to a vet center, you know. But for the rest, they got the, from their family, they don't have no funds. No, I, I mean, they burdens of the system. Yeah, j- just one response. There's, there's been a big growth in individuals with severe mental illnesses in, in, in long-term care, and we, we've documented that in some of our papers in the nursing home area. It, it's really staggering, and with the closure of, of state psych- psychiatric hospitals, um, you know, it, it's, it's been this huge growth among both the elderly and non-elderly in nursing homes. And I, th- I think we're seeing the same thing in home and community-based settings. I think we're seeing the same thing in assisted living. So that's going to be a real issue moving forward in long-term care policy. How do we kind of blend sort of the traditional long-term care patient with a very different patient in need of, of uh, counseling with, with severe mental illnesses? Maybe that's a, a, a place to stop. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, David. You know, the, I, I decide on the title for the for the conferences before the speakers have had a chance to, to figure out exactly what they're going to say, and it's nice to see um, that, that Dr. Grabowski covered both the good, bad, and the ugly of long-term care. And even though maybe what came out in terms of the class act does look a little bit like a spaghetti western, uh, at least we uh, realize that there are some some uh, some potentially good options to follow. So we're going to break now uh, for lunch, and so uh, we for the the total um, lunch time is going to go 12 to 1:30. Um, but we have our, our keynote speaker, Mark Duggan, is going to start speaking here at 12.30. Uh, so we have box lunches out, out there in the lobby. Please go grab one and, and your drinks, and we'll start up again at, uh, in half an hour.